Welcome back to a, another Tech Talk uh, presented by Soil Optics with Crop Care Consulting and Trevor Thornton. Uh, today in our episode, our newest episode here, uh, we're going to be talking calcium lime and all of it relating over to soil optics. Um, so again, here is Trevor to walk us through what he's doing out in Western Canada. Thanks, Zach. Um, welcome to uh, Tech Talk on calcium lime and soil optics. I'm Trevor Thornton. Uh, running crop care out of Manitoba and mapping soil optics in Western Canada. Uh, the topic of calcium and lime has come up a lot in uh, agriculture recently, and this is quite a long subject. So in order to, uh, you know, abide by some time restrictions that we want for the videos to be within, we decided to do it in two parts. So um, if you're watching this one first, fantastic. Um, if you, uh, once this one's done, then certainly head over to watch the part two when you're ready. So let's dive into it. We're going to talk some agronomy first when we look at lime and calcium because that's really important in understanding on the reasons why we're doing this. When you look at pH spectrum, and I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this have seen charts like this before, when you get into the sweet spot of your pH from just under six to you know about seven, that's when we get most nutrient availability, especially when you get that six five to six eight, that's kind of the sweet spot. As your pHs get low, we've got uh, some nutrients that are a little bit more available. Uh, but also nutrients that are less available and, and different tie-ups of those nutrients. When we get into the high pH scenario, uh, again, we've got a few nutrients that are more available, but nutrients like your phosphorus uh, um, and your micronutrients become less available. So understanding the pH and how it affects nutrient availability helps us decide on how we're going to apply the nutrients to that field. But you also look at different yield uh, potentials when you look at those different pHs. So if we take a pH of five, and we look at wheat, you're losing about 25% of your yield. Soybeans, you're about 20%, corn, almost 30%, alfalfa, you're over 90% of your yield loss potential. Now, keep in mind too, this will have some environmental impacts. If you're in a very wet season, these losses won't be near as significant. If you're on a dry season, these losses, and we have seen it, will be even more severe, uh, what Midwest Labs is suggesting in this slide. But not only are we losing yield, we have fertilizer efficiency problems. So that same soil 5 pH, uh, when you look at your fertilizer efficiencies, we're losing potentially 53% of our fertilizer. We're, we're not getting value out of it in the crop. So we're losing yield and we're losing some of those fertilizer dollars we're putting into the field. That's something we really need to you know, keep in mind when we're looking at how we're going to manage nutrition for a crop. Pitchers are worth a thousand. Uh, words. So this is a picture that we had in Manitoba. This is where the lime was piled on an irrigated uh, potato field in the dryland corner. Uh, the particular grower got quite nervous when he saw uh, areas of the field looking quite poor out past that where the pile was, where the lime pile was, the, the crop was looking better. And then out in the pivot circle on the dryland wheat, um, where we lined before, the, the crop was looking better again. When you look at a close-up picture, and this is just an area um, walking, you know, between those two spots that I just showed you, a significant difference. It almost looks like you're walking from a, a fertilized area of the field to the unfertilized area. These areas had the same amount of fertilizer. The only difference is this spot that's quite green has lime applied or well, mistakenly because it fell off the truck. This area is the natural pH of, of what the background of that soil was. When we pulled some soil samples, that was down in this corner, you can see the pH was four or five. I referred to a pH before a five. What are we losing in fertilizer efficiencies and yield potential when we get down to these, these levels? It's, it's significant as you can tell by the crop. But I want you to remember this, pH is a result, not a cause. A lot of people focus on fixing the pH, which is important, but magnesium influences our pH 1.67 times more than calcium. So we can actually have a high pH soil with low available calcium because it's really, really high in magnesium. And the pH is settling out because it is a result of what's happening. So we need to treat the source, not the cause or not the result. What affects our pH in the soil? Well, the kind of parent material when our soil was laid down, laid down originally. Rainfall, leaching nutrients out such as calcium, magnesium, or salts accumulating in low rainfall areas because of the fertilizer that we're applying. The plants that are growing during foil soil formation, but not only that, the crops that we're growing every year, because every year the crops we grow do remove nitrogen um, and other nutrients such as the calcium and magnesium out of those soils. And what are your fertilizer input choices? 
So somebody challenged me on this fertilizer input choice. This is a bit of a confusing slide, so I'm hoping I can explain it properly. But what we're looking at is calcium displaced by one ton of product. And I know you don't apply these nutrients, uh, these products by the ton, but just work with me here. So one ton of urea displaces almost 1,700 pounds of calcium. Potassium chloride displaces nothing. Phosphorus uh, displaces 1,300 pounds. And ammonium sulfate had quite a range, so we picked one in the middle at about 5,000. So if we look at a typical rotation, a poor rotation of wheat canola, and you've done that over 10 years, and assume we had some cheap fines in there that we were spread on aggressively more on the canola year. And we're going for a fairly healthy crop, so we have a fairly healthy blend. This blend might not fit all the areas of the prairies, but you know, for some areas, this is actually probably on a little bit on the low side. But we take a canola blend of 130, 50, 0, 48, and then a wheat blend of 140, 0, 0. The urea is displacing 1,900 pounds of calcium over that 10 years. Our phosphorus is displacing 530. Our ammonium sulfate is displacing almost 2,300 pounds. So when you add it up, we're displacing 4,700 pounds of calcium. This is not lime. This is just the calcium. And we wonder why our pH is low. And this doesn't account for the 30 to 50 pounds our crops are removing every year. So if you're starting with a low pH and doing a program like this, and you wonder why your pH is real low. Well, we've, we've basically done that to ourselves and not, um, not amending it. So when you look at what do I need for, for the calcium, pH should not be the only determining factor as we mentioned it before. You need to understand your base saturation from a good quality lab, the quality of the lime and the crop performance. That's because it's important when we're adjusting those soil pHs. When you look at growing a crop and, and how important it is, most farms and most agronomists start with nitrogen, but it actually takes boron, silica, and calcium to get to the nitrogen. And if we're missing calcium, we've got a hiccup in that stage. If we're missing boron, we're maybe not getting that, that calcium into that crop, although the nitrogen will be good. So what do we do? Well, let's put on more nitrogen because that'll grow us a better crop. And a lot of farms are experiencing the higher nitrogen they go uh, in order just to maintain the crops they had. Yields aren't going up. Well, if we start with the calcium and the boron, and get the nutrients set up right, that plant actually has a chance now. So we look at the benefits of calcium and lime, we got improved soil structure. We get better water infiltration and percolation, meaning we got better, better water that can go into that soil when we have those heavy rains, but also when it gets dry and we got subsurface, we can have that water come back up to the surface. It loosens those soil up so they're more, um, more tilth to them. It improves your nutrient availability. Uh, the microbial activity, now we're building a house for the microbes that they want to live in, reduces toxic levels of manganese and aluminum. So now the plants have a chance to grow even better, improves the palatability of feed for the animals, uh, reduces weeds. And we're going to show you some information on that soon. Uh, because we're growing a healthier plant, we're reducing fungicide needs and ultimately can reduce insect feeding in a crop because our crops are healthier. Ultimately, get to the end of it, we improve the plant stands, we improve the plant health, we got better standability, more even earlier maturing harvest, uh, ultimately increased yield and increased quality, and this is what we're going for. So by adding that calcium, if you need it, and we can get these factors happening, uh, the payback is pretty quick when you look at it, although it is a, quite an expensive input. When you look at a pH map of Manitoba, you know, look at Alberta here, and there's a lot of low pHs in Alberta. There's a few pockets in Saskatchewan, um, some smaller pockets in Manitoba, uh, but we do have a pH issue in, in Western Canada. And when you look at the clubroot map of Alberta, where clubroot was found originally and a major issue, it matches pretty close where those low pHs are. So if we want to get growing canola again, don't you think we should start looking at our pHs and our calcium levels in our soils? But what calcium do I use? Do I use a limestone? Do I use lime? Do I use slake lime? Do we look at gypsum or someone's snake oil? We saw at a trade show and there's, there's a pile of that that's out there. When you look at the limestone cycle, it starts with the calcium carbonate. We add heat, we get to a calcium oxide. When we add water to that, we now get a calcium hydroxide, a slake lime. That dissolved in water gives you lime water. You bubble carbon dioxide through that lime water and now we're back to a calcium carbonate. Why is understanding this important? Well, because there's different uh, availability of those different products. The calcium carbonate is slow. We need lots of tons, but it is fairly cheap. But by the time you add those tons up, is it really that cheap? Calcium oxide or a quick lime is rapid. It's usually more expensive, 
and it is hard to handle because it's almost like sugar. A slaked lime that's had water run through it or CKD um, is rapid uh, as far as how it works on our soil. It's a little bit easier to handle because we have some moisture in it. It's affordable for now, but think of it as a driver. Also the calcium oxide, think of it as a driver. That's what you pull out of your golf bag to hit your ball down that fairway. Gypsum is not used for fixing calcium levels, but it's used for tapping it in. Uh, so think of it as your putter. So what do you need to put on your fields? Well, ultimately it depends. We need good soil information. We need someone who can read that soil information properly, and we need good products and an understanding of when to use them. Example, do I need gypsum? Do I need lime? Or do we need a combination of both of them on my field to fix the challenges that I'm having? But when you get into that, do I need a calcitic lime or do I need a dolomitic lime? So there's a lot of information you have to consider in order to do it right. Well, so what? Well, if we apply too much lime or try to push that pH too much over 7.2, now we're gonna introduce issues that we didn't have before of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, boron, iron, zinc, and manganese. And it's a lot more expensive to drop a pH than it is to raise a pH. So by not understanding what you're doing, you could create problems that you never had before. So in the end, you were probably better just to leave the field alone and deal with, with the issues that you had. So now we're gonna look at a little bit of uh, some pictures and some soil information. So this is uh, just a composite sample from an alfalfa field from a good area of the field and a bad area of the field. And you can see our pH here is at six, seven versus a seven, three. But more importantly, look at our calcium. We're at 58% calcium, which is low, and 72% calcium, which is good. Um, one spot a little bit higher in mag. We're pretty equal in potassium. Um, you know, a little different in organic matter, but not substantially. A little bit different in phosphorus. But for the most part, all things being equal. When you look at the good calcium spot versus the poor calcium spot, this happened about four days into heat stress a couple summers ago and, and minimal water that was coming down. The plants that had adequate calcium are thriving. Uh, the poor calcium spots, you can see they've, they've given up the ghost. They're starting to lose their leaves. Well, what's this going to do to the palatability and the feed quality going into those animals at the end of the day? Uh, this is another field where we had calcium uh, put on and not calcium. So this here, both of these pictures are looking at the unintended check strip where the calcium didn't get put on. And right beside it, not that far away, you can see the alfalfa is full and thick. Even the grass looks better. And, uh, you know, the, the calcium's made a huge difference as far as yield and quality in, uh, in this forage crop. So we got working with an organic grower that had thistle patches spread across his field. He wanted to see what, if anything, was driving those patches. So we did a uh, soil optics for him. But specifically, when you look at Canada thistle, and this is uh, weeds and why they grow, I do recommend this book. Um, calcium is low, phosphorus could be low, potassium is high, your manganese could be very low. Uh, iron quite high, copper low, organic matter humus low, uh, and a few other things in there. So that's what should drive thistles. So we map the field, and this is our phosphorus uh, map. So we've got areas in the field below 10 part per million up to spots that are close to 70. We have calcium in this field ranging from, you know, in somewhere in the 30s and 40s up to spots that were in, you know, probably in mid 80s, uh, a few spots over here. So quite a variation in this field. It's a heavier textured land. So what we saw when we we're sampling the field and then put the results together, anytime we got below 58% calcium, thistles started showing up. Below 20 part per million phosphorus, and the lower it went, the heavier the thistle patch. Above 29% magnesium, we had more thistles, but we also had a poorer crop, and this crop was seeded to a cover crop. So we had that as a point of reference. But what we found was organic matter, manganese, and potassium had no influence on the thistle at all. However, if the phosphorus was low and the manganese was high, we had no thistle. Generally, the manganese had no influence, but in this specific thing. So it's not just one thing that's causing those thistles, it's a balance of everything. So our recommendations to them was to find some and use some organic lime, uh, some gypsum and spots in different varying amounts. We suggested some humic acid, as much phosphorus as his budget would allow, and consider some site-specific manganese in order to take care of the thistle on his organic farm. With that, that's a pretty quick go over of part one of our soil optics. Thanks for joining us today for our tech talk and I'll uh, turn it back to Zach. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, and just one comment, you know, you started off 
uh, discussing, you know, lime and calcium and, and how that and how how all that really fits together, right? But it's it's interesting on how as you end that first part on how much that also influences other uh, other properties, right, or other things that are going on in the field, and that you know we can always look at one thing, but that's also affecting something else, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and and I'm that's really really interesting to kind of end off on that note as we end off this part one here, and as we look forward to uh, diving a bit deeper into this uh, this topic here uh, in part two, which will be coming out uh, soon. So I appreciate your time here, Trevor, and uh, be on the lookout for our second part of calcium lime and soil optics uh, presenting tech talks here. So thank you. Thank you.